What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties, and I have a desk now. The camera is therefore positioned in a slightly different spot than it usually is. We'll see how it goes. And in this room, in my office, uh, there's not a whole lot of light. The plants are dying, but the takes are thriving. And today I have a take for you that I've been kind of like mulling around over in my head for a little bit. And it's that I believe you should trade the 101 in rookie drafts this offseason. Let's get into it. <laughs> The consensus 101, and rightfully so, this is not a Brees Hall should not be the 101 argument. The consensus number one in rookie drafts this year is Brees Hall, and that's because he checks every box we want to see from our running back prospects. He had a 95th percentile dominator rating, a 97th percentile breakout age, 54th percentile BMI at 5'11 and 217 pounds. He ran a 4.39, which gives him a 98th percentile speed score. He catches passes. He had an 81st percentile target share. He caught 20 passes every season. That's a box checked. 87th percentile receptions totals. If you check all of those boxes, like you're a good player, right? For the most part, I think that's true. But that's not exactly how it works. Uh, with these filters, you know, we've got production, early breakouts, size, speed score, pass catching. With those filters, we get guys like Marshawn Lynch, Noshawn Moreno, Trent Richardson, Le'Veon Bell, Ezekiel Elliott, Kenneth Dixon, Leonard Fournette, Royce Freeman, Saquon Barkley, Cam Akers, and Jonathan Taylor. Some of those guys didn't turn out. Some of them, like, weren't early declares like Brees Hall was. It's not a perfect hit rate, but that's not really the point. The point's not that our hit rate isn't 100%. The point is that while these things are indicators that guys will be good players, they don't actually say much at all about how good a player is on the field. I fired off a tweet yesterday, which, when this video comes out, will have been, like, four days ago, but it asked people, like, what is it specifically that, like, Brees Hall does better than Royce Freeman did as a prospect? And a lot of the answers were, like, he declared early, and he had a higher dominator rating, and he had a higher target share, and his speed score was higher, and he had a higher burst score. Those are all things that indicate that Brees Hall might be a better player than Royce Freeman. And to be clear, I think Brees Hall is a better player than Royce Freeman. I think he's a better prospect than Royce Freeman was also. But the point is that those things are not, they don't say anything about what Brees Hall is as a player. Running fast and posting a high dominator rating and having a high target share are not tangible skills. They are the results of skills. And so very little like understanding among like at least consumers of, you know, dynasty content or whatnot about like what it is that actually makes Brees Hall a good player. And I think that because that's hard to articulate, I think we generally don't have a good understanding of what makes these guys good players. And so I want to explore that outside of the context of just like, yeah, he checks these boxes that typically suggest a guy is a good player. Imagine two types of runners. The first one is a guy who doesn't have a lot of like open field juice. He might not make many big plays. Maybe because of that, he has a low yard per carry average, but he like consistently gets the yardage needed. He avoids negative plays. He moves the chains, things like that. So he doesn't have like a great yard per carry average because he's not a dynamic player, but he's doing the things that need to be done on each play. He's not, he's not a net, he's not a net negative to his team's running game. He's a net positive. Our second guy doesn't do those same like down in and down out nuanced things, but he has a high yard per carry average because he's dynamic in the open field. He creates lots of big plays. You know, these archetypes of players are familiar to us. You know, one of them feels like a two down grinder. You know, a guy like, I don't know, Jordan Howard might be like this. You know, he's not a huge big play runner, but he's, he's solid. He makes the right reads. He gets the yardage needed where a guy like Duke Johnson is, you know, not a traditionally like nuanced and instinctive, like between the tackles runner, but he's quick. He's dynamic in the open field. He makes big plays. And because of that, he's efficient. Two types of guys there. Back to Brees Hall. Brees Hall, just a quick overview of kind of his, his, his rushing efficiency profile in college. His yards per carry relative to the other guys at Iowa State was 0.65 higher than his teammates. That's in the 55th percentile. So he's outdoing them to a fairly average, slightly above average degree. But he was doing that while seeing box counts 
that were 0.2 defenders heavier than the box counts seen by other Iowa State running backs on average. So the, that's a that's an 86th percentile like disadvantage in the box counts that Brees Hall is seeing relative to his teammates. So he's fairly hamstrung there by like running into heavy boxes, and he's still more efficient than them anyway. And a metric I created called box adjusted efficiency rating, which kind of accounts for those box counts, suggests that he's a good player. He had a 125% mark in box adjusted efficiency rating, which is in the 73rd percentile. It's very good. Part of what makes Brees Hall an effective and efficient player is that he's very dynamic in the open field. His breakaway conversion rate, which just measures what he's doing in the open field, he's already reached 10 yards on his runs. How often is he converting those into runs of 20 yards or greater? He does that at a 38% clip, which is in the 80th percentile. On the other hand, Brees Hall's not making frequent trips to the secondary. So while he's good when he gets there, he's not there that often relative to, to other running back prospects, and especially relative to even the other running backs at Iowa State. His chunk rate plus, which essentially just is his 10-yard run rate, minus the 10-yard run rate of the other guys on the team, is negative 0.4%. So his 10-yard run rate is slightly lower than the other guys at Iowa State, and it's a 34th percentile mark among running back prospects in the last 15 years. The other side of box-adjusted efficiency rating is relative success rate, which is a consistency metric. It measures how often are you gaining a requisite amount of yards given down a distance, given the box counts you're seeing relative to your teammates, how often are you producing positive outcomes on your carries? Relative success rate doesn't know on third and four if you gained six yards or 80 yards. It just knows that you converted the four yards that you needed. And so your impact in the, in the open field is irrelevant to relative success rate. Relative success rate just looks at how often are you succeeding on your runs. In that metric, Brees Hall is a little bit better than his teammates at Iowa State, 1.2%, but that's only a 45th percentile mark. It's not very impressive. And as that relates to kind of Brees Hall's impact in the open field versus his impact like at the line of scrimmage, actually getting to the open field, he gained in 2021, 38.2% of Brees Hall's total yardage, his total rushing yardage came after he was already in the open field. So he ignoring what he did, you know, within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage after he's already passed 10 yards from the line of scrimmage. That's where 38%, nearly 40% of his yardage came 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. That's number one in the class. And Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker are the only guys in the class who had more than 35% of their yards come in the open field. The class average is 25%. So if you take the average amount of yards gained in the open field for a 2022 running back and multiply it by 1.5, you almost have what Brees Hall is doing in the open field. So what do we do with that information? Number one, being dynamic in the open field is objectively good. If I could choose between a player who is good in the open field and a guy who is not good in the open field and I didn't know anything else about them, obviously I'm going to pick the guy who is dynamic in the open field. Same thing with like athleticism. I'd rather have a guy who runs a 4-3 than a 4-6 if I didn't know anything else about them. It's an objectively good thing. Relying on your long runs for your production when you're not doing a good job of churning out positive plays on a consistent basis is not a good thing. So there's this good thing that Brees Hall does where he's dynamic in the open field. And then there's this objectively not good thing that Brees Hall does where when he's not creating big plays, he's not producing efficiently. He's an explosive and efficient runner, but I'm not confident that he's an especially skilled runner outside of the context of creating big plays while he's already in the open field. And that speaks to something that I've called just kind of in my own analysis, the Jeremy McNichols corollary, which says that running back with positive efficiency that is fueled by long runs despite low consistency are risky projections to the next level. Brees Hall falls under the Jeremy McNichols corollary. And guys who've done this in the past are Marlon Mack, Kenneth Dixon, Ronald Jones, Leonard Fournette, Amir Abdullah, Tevin Coleman, Darrington Evans, Justice Hill, Javid Best, Saquon Barkley, LaMichael James, and Ty Johnson is the king of of the Jeremy McNichols corollary, he had a 98th percentile breakaway conversion rate in college, which helped him produce a 57th percentile relative yards per carry, despite a 13th percentile chunk rate. So he was getting to the open field far less often than his teammates, but he was amazing once he was there, which made his overall efficiency look good, even though he might not be a skilled runner. And Ty Johnson hasn't really been that good in the NFL. A lot of these guys have been good players. A lot of them have been worse players than we would have thought, given how effective they were as college runners. And there are lots of other guys who had low, like, chunk rate plus numbers. You know, Brees Hall is in, what was it, the 44th percentile there? The 34th percentile. 
while there. There are a lot of other guys who had low chunk rate plus numbers, but don't qualify for the McNichols corollary because they weren't good in the open field or they weren't efficient overall or whatever. But just looking at what a low chunk rate number indicates about a player, how well are you navigating the line of scrimmage, the first line of the defense, and getting to the open field relative to your teammates. Other guys who didn't do that well in the past are Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Jalen Richard, Trey Sermon, Bernard Pierce, TJ Yeldon, Trent Richardson, John Kelly, uh, Jacques Patrick, David Cobb, Ryan Nall, CJ Anderson, Jamal Williams, Kadeem Carey, Michael Pirine, James Williams, Carlos Williams, Jay Ajayi, Dan Heron, and then guys in this class like Raheem Blackshear, Tyrion Davis-Price, and Greg Bell. I, I just named every player within like a percentage of Brees Hall in chunk rate plus. I didn't skip anybody. Those are all the players in Brees Hall's range in my database in chunk rate plus. He falls in with those guys. Have any of those guys been good in the NFL? Like Jamal Williams has been fine. CJ Anderson was decent. Jay Ajayi had a couple good years. Um, I'm looking through this list. Trent Richardson had a good season before he flamed out. Like none of those guys have been very good. Let's, let's put aside chunk rate for a second. If we look at relative success rate, which is how often are you gaining a requisite amount of yards given down a distance relative to your teammates? How does Brees Hall stack up in that metric relative to other running backs who've come out and been highly drafted in the last few years? So among round one and round two backs since 2019, which is as far back as the relative success rate data goes, the order of relative success rate from best to worst goes Kenneth Walker in the 90th percentile, and I'm assuming he gets first or second round draft capital, AJ Dillon, Josh Jacobs, Clyde edwards helaire Javante Williams, uh, Jonathan Taylor, Travis Etienne, Najee Harris, and Cam Akers. All of those guys are above the 60th percentile. And then there's a line, and then we're below the 50th percentile, and we have Brees Hall, J.K. Dobbins, DeAndre Swift, Miles Sanders. J.K. Dobbins is a fun player. He's good in the open field. DeAndre Swift is a fun player, supposedly dynamic. Miles Sanders is not a very, like, nuanced and instinctive between-the-tackles runner. I would much prefer that group, even with, you know, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, I would much prefer that first group that's good at relative success rate or looks good there versus that group that doesn't look good there. Like, I think this is a, it's a pretty strong indicator that some of these guys just aren't nuanced, not instinctive runners at the line of scrimmage at the point of attack despite being dynamic athletes who can create in the open field. So that's my point about Brees Hall as a runner. There's also this element to his profile. You know, he gets this reputation as like a three down back. You know, he had like 87 receptions in college, passing game weapon, and he did. He had a 67th percentile target share, 87th percentile receptions totals. But those things indicate that a player was used in the passing game. They don't necessarily indicate that a player is a quality receiver, especially from like an NFL point of view. He was split out wide in the passing game, less than 5% of the time, which is in the 25th percentile. He was targeted negative 0.6 yards on average, which is an dot in the 30th percentile. So he's not being moved around the formation. He's not being asked to run like advanced routes downfield ahead of the line of scrimmage. He's catching checkdowns. He's catching swing passes. He's catching screens like that. And he's not fucking those up. You know, he had a 74th percentile catch rate. But again, degree of difficulty is low. And if you look at his true catch rate, which just shows you what is he doing on the targets that are catchable, he had an 88% true catch rate, which seems solid. It was, I don't have historical numbers for that, but that's 18 out of 38 running backs in this draft class. And just for some context, Tyler Algier was targeted, what, like behind the line of scrimmage. He had like an 87% catch rate. So either way, it's relatively comparable to, a, to what a guy like Tyler Algier is doing. Catching the ball behind the line of scrimmage, easy throws, and then just being efficient because you can yak your way to yardage and truck a corner or whatever. I think David Montgomery and Javante Williams are like guys who fit the Brees Hall receiver archetype as, you know, they're, they're fine there, they're decent there, they're not some Alvin Kamara type weapon. Brees Hall was heavily used as a receiver in college. I don't know that the you know, more like microscope level metrics indicate that he's a great receiver. This other element to his profile where he's like three down back, I think he's just fine there. I think it's maybe even likely that there's like a Tariq Cohen type on whatever team he ends up on that he seeds passing game work to. So there's some indicators that he might not be like a skilled and nuanced runner despite being efficient because of his big plays. And there are some indicators that despite being a high volume receiver, he might not actually be that skilled of a receiver either. The bottom line with him is he checks all of the superficial, like, bird's eye view boxes. Like, he was productive, he's fast, he's big, he caught passes, you know, things like that. He's got a good burst score. But on a closer look, he doesn't check out as a no-doubt player, and that doesn't mean that Brees Hall will bust. My take here is not that Brees Hall will bust. But you have three options 
with the 101. Number one, you could take Brees Hall. He's the best player in this draft class. If you're using your pick at the 101, you should be taking Brees Hall. The second option is that you take a different player. You pivot off of Brees Hall for whatever reason. I suppose if you're in a super flex league, pivoting to, to Malik Willis makes some sense. I don't think I would do it, but I, I, I probably wouldn't take a different player. Or number three, you can trade out. You don't have to use the 101. And I think there are kind of like two circumstances here. Number one, you're a bad team that earned the 101. In that case, you're the worst team in your league. Brees Hall isn't going to fix your team on his own in most cases. You know, maybe you had like a ton of injuries last year. You got Christian McCaffrey, Russell Wilson had a bad season. You know, whatever. Maybe you have some high upside guys who disappointed last year and Brees Hall's the missing piece. But generally, if you have the 101, your team sucks. Brees Hall's not going to fix you on his own. Given the quality of the 2023 class, being as bad as possible going into next year has some value. If I could choose between being the worst team in the league and having the 101 in 2022 rookie drafts versus being the worst team in the league, and having the 101 in 2023 rookie drafts, I'll take 2023. I think it's a better class. And while you don't guarantee yourself that you're going to have the 101 again, I think the point is that Brees Hall isn't going to, on his own, likely is not going to make you a good team. The other side of this is that you're a good team that traded for the 101. I think there's some utility to pivoting out of this 101 in favor of looking forward to 2023. A guy in my Twitter DMs just just hopped in there, asked me a question um, about like what you would do with the 101, looking forward to 2023. He just flipped the 101 for two 2023 firsts and a wide receiver upgrade. I think it was like a Michael Pittman, uh, Cortland Sutton thing. So he like upgraded at wide receiver, got two 2023 firsts for flipping the 101. One, essentially flipping Brees Hall for a wide receiver upgrade and two firsts in a very strong class next year. I'm smashing on that deal. And the other side of this is that if you're a good team that traded for the 101, you could find similar upside to the upside that Brees Hall has via some sort of trade package. Uh, I'd be looking for like Travis Etienne, Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook, Nick Chubb. I'd be looking for one of those guys plus something to pivot off of Brees Hall. Brees Hall is currently going ahead of all of those guys in Dynasty Startups. So there's some difference in value there from, you know, Brees Hall to Nick Chubb that you could, you know, pivot kind of get a one-for-one one replacement plus something on top of it. And I looked at recent trades on the DLF Trade Finder um, to see like what kinds of things were going down with the 101. And I'll just list a couple of them here. 101 for Austin Eckler plus Antonio Gibson. 101 and two-fourths for Najee Harris and Michael Thomas. 101 for J.K. Dobbins and Debo Samuel. 101 plus Rondell Moore plus a 2023 second for Nick Chubb, Cortland Sutton, and a 2023 fourth. 101 for the 104 and TJ Hawkinson. 101 and Tony Pollard and a second for Mixon and the 104. 101 and Hunter Renfro for Alvin Kamara and Saquon Barkley. And then 101 and Jared Goff for an upgrade to Russell Wilson and the 106. I would take probably any of those package deals over taking Hall at the 101. And I really don't want this to be misunderstood as Brees Hall isn't perfect, so don't take him. No player is perfect, but there are imperfections that are better to have than others. It, like Mark Ingram was not athletic, if, but you don't have to be a 4-4 guy to be successful as a running back in the NFL. Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb don't catch passes, but you don't have to be a good receiver to be an effective and high volume runner in the NFL. Alvin Kamara wasn't productive in college, but you don't have to have high volume to prove effective on a per touch basis. There are ways to be an imperfect prospect that don't necessarily speak to an inability to do the things that are fundamental to your position. If Brees Hall is failing at navigating the line of scrimmage and producing positive outcomes on a consistent basis relative to the other guys at Iowa State and relative to, to other high-end running back prospects, that's a flaw that is fundamental to his job of playing running back, running the ball. If that's where his flaw lies, it's cause for concern. That's not the same as being a little bit slow. That's not the same as being underutilized in college. And it's not the same as not being a great pass catcher. I'm pivoting off of the 101. I'm selling out of Brees Hall in Dynasty Rookie Drafts.